I want to thank you for tuning into our broadcast today. We've got another great service in store for you. Each week we are seeing new people being drawn into the presence of God. Now, when I came to faith in Christ, there were three things that caused me to follow him. First of all, I felt his presence real strong. Secondly, I saw his power at work. And finally, I heard the truth of God's word. For the past 26 years, we've been committed to seeing lives transformed through these same three principles. We need your help to bring this life-changing experience to a generation that so desperately needs a foundation of faith. Now, if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please let us know. You can contact us or partner with us through our website at libertychurchmi.com. Take a minute and check it out. Now, here's today's message. I hope you enjoy it. morning I want to talk to you about right and wrong and right and wrong is something that should be black and white all the time you know we live in a world where there's a lot of gray areas uh, right and wrong seems to change with each passing generation things that kids used to face in school and struggle with in school you know 50 70 years ago it was chewing gum you know and talking in class I was just at Oxford High School yesterday uh, refereeing a volleyball tournament, and they have the picture of one of the volleyball players that was killed um, last year. Uh, she was a volleyball player. Hannah was her name. And uh, it's just so sad to see what our kids are facing in schools these days, metal detectors and security guards and things that they have to go through uh, every day now out at Oxford when they go to school and many other schools. A 2015 Barna survey showed that only 46% of Christians believe that moral truth is absolute. Not 46% of people, 46% of Christians believe that moral truth is absolute. What does that mean? That right and wrong is right and wrong every time. That it's not something that's conditional. It's not something that's situational. In fact, 83% of teenagers believe that moral truth is situational meaning truth depends on where you're at, depends on the situation, the friends that you're hanging around, the environment that you're in, the culture that you're in. I want you to uh, hear a scripture this morning. Jesus is praying for his disciples in John chapter 17. And, you know, Jesus didn't have any children, but these were his children, his disciples, his spiritual children, those that he raised. And he prays this prayer before he is getting ready to go to the cross. He says, they do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Notice the word truth, how many times he uses that in this sentence. He's saying truth is the answer to making them holy, or literally, if you study that word out in, in the New Testament, it's to make them whole. You know, a lot of our kids are hurting. They're not whole. They're struggling with, with mental health and, and, and social anxiety and being accepted and, and being popular and all those things. And he's saying the answer, he says, make them whole by your truth, by your truth. He says, I'm sending them into the world. If you're a parent this morning, every morning, you send your kids into the world. And what's going to make them whole, what's going to keep them, what's going to preserve them is the truth. What is right and wrong? What is true? What is absolute moral truth in their life? And these are the things that we need to impart into our kids. We are in the world, Jesus says, but we shouldn't stand, be part of the world. As a matter of fact, we should stand out as different from the world as much as Jesus stood out as being different from the world. He says they are in this world. But he says, I don't want them to be a part of this world, to, to, to be blended into the world, to look like the world. Paul said, come out from among the world and be separated, be different, live different lives. It's not our goal to be like the world. It's our goal to be like Jesus. And number one in your outline, absolute truth should be our standard of right and wrong. Absolute truth, truth should be our standard of right and wrong. Jesus is the truth, the Bible says. And so Jesus should be our standard of right and wrong. 
And so uh, truth doesn't depend on culture. It doesn't depend on your generation. It doesn't depend on the people that you're hanging around, the place that you're hanging around. It's not subjective. It's not situational. Truth doesn't change based on our environment. Truth is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. 2,000 years later, he's still the truth. And not only that, but he says the word is truth. And the Bible says in the beginning, the word was there at creation. Jesus was there at the creation. So it's not just 2,000 years. The truth has been the truth for 6,000 years. It doesn't change. For example, murder is wrong. They said back in the Old Testament, thou shalt not murder. I know it says thou shalt not kill, but literally it's murder. Something you do with malice. Something you do with, with an evil intent. And that's true under every circumstance, including unborn children. Amen. Truth is the standard we should use when we're guiding our children's lives. One of the challenges in the world today is that we want to make our kids happy. Happiness should not be the standard that we raise our kids by. Truth should be the standard that we raise our kids by. And unfortunately, I believe that a lot of parents, we raise our kids based on us wanting to be popular with them, us wanting to be happy. When our kids are happy, then we're happy. But you know, happiness changes based on cultural trends. What makes kids happy today is completely different than what made kids happy 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Truth doesn't change but the standards of happiness can change based on your environment. And it shouldn't be that way. One of the most wonderful experiences I had of my life, or I should say eye-opening experiences, is when I went to Haiti uh, several years ago, just for a couple of days, spent a couple of days there. Haiti is the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. I mean, the houses that most of these people lived in were made of the metal skirting that you see around uh, the bottom of mobile home trailers. That's what they would use to make houses. I went to use a bathroom at an orphanage, and it was literally, they took dirt and clay and, and molded something that appeared like a throne on the ground and, and, and a big hole that was dug underneath it. That was the bathroom. I said, I'll wait till I get back to the hotel. I think I can make it. These people lived in some of the worst conditions you could imagine. The roads were like driving on the surface of the moon, just, just terrible potholes everywhere. But yet the one thing that I noticed was there was a smile on every person's face. That these people were some of the most joyful people that I've ever been around in my life. See, we condition our happiness based on our possessions, based on the money we have, based on what we own, based on our environment. They were in some of the worst environment you could imagine. But yet their happiness was something that was remarkable to me. And so we often, uh, oftentimes end up raising our kids based on our own securities because we want our kids to love us. You know, maybe you struggle with being affirmed. Maybe you struggle with being loved. Maybe you struggle with being accepted. And so you do everything you can to make your kids happy because you want them to love you. You want to be popular with your kids because you have insecurities in your life. We have to raise our kids based on truth. We have to understand that, again, uh, the, the word holy in the New Testament doesn't mean perfect. It means whole, W-H-O-L-E, to be whole. Whole in your spirit, whole in your mind, whole in your body. And so wholeness or holiness must be a higher goal for our kids than happiness. Let me say that again because that's a good statement to take in. Their wholeness must be a greater goal than their happiness. And Jesus said in our text this morning that we are made whole by the truth. The truth. And so we have to raise our kids based on what's true. Not what's popular. Not what makes them happy. Most immoral things that kids get involved in today are not necessarily because they believe it's true, but because they believe it's popular. There are things that kids are battling in their schools right now with regard to their gender, with regard to their sexuality. 
And I've talked to some of these kids and, and, and I've prayed for some of these kids and I try to minister to some of these kids and, and, and at the real core of it, they don't believe it's right, but it's popular. I don't believe they, they, they want to be a different sex, a different gender, a different orientation because I don't believe they, they know it's right, but they know it's popular. And they want to be loved. They want to be accepted. Why? Because there's a lack of love maybe at their, their household, in their home. Maybe they've experienced rejection through a, a broken home, a, a parent that's absent or a parent that's abused them or a parent that is just not a part of their life anymore. And so our kids get into things like vaping and, and homosexuality and gender transitions and things like that when what they're really craving is love and acceptance. And that's the most important thing that we can give them is our love. Not, not their happiness by buying them things or letting them do things. Those can never be a substitute for our love and our care. Our kids are far smarter than you give them credit for sometimes. And the truth is that discipline is the highest form of love. We talked a little bit about this last week. The Bible says that the Father disciplines those that he loves. God disciplines us because he loves us. Look what Proverbs chapter 13 says in verse 24. And this is Solomon passing down wisdom that he received from his father David down to his son. He says, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. We always say spoil their children, but the Bible says they hate their children if you don't discipline them. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. And I know, again, there are several here maybe that don't have children this morning, but realize that God disciplines us sometimes because discipline is a very high form of love. And so again, this is Solomon passing down wisdom he received from his father, David. But you know, David wasn't always the greatest parent in the world. David had some real dysfunctional issues with his family. And he learned some very tough parenting lessons. I'm just going to read you an excerpt here from 2 Samuel chapter 13. And, and, and again, I've spliced several scriptures together just to give you a, kind of a glimpse of some of the things that were going on in David, King David's household. It says, now David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar. And Amnon, her half-brother, fell desperately in love with her. Amnon became so obsessed, obsessed with his half-sister Tamar that he became ill. He grabbed her and demanded, come to bed with me, my darling sister. No, my brother, she cried, don't be foolish. Don't do this to me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Two years later, Absalom told his men, wait until Amnon gets drunk and that at my signal, kill him. So Absalom, at Absalom's signal, they murdered Amnon. These are David's kids. One rapes his half-sister. Her brother has him killed. These are the things going on in his household early on in his life. Because early on, David was not a very good parent. He had to learn some lessons. Maybe he was too busy. Maybe because he was the king and all the responsibility he had. We talked a little bit about this last week. What good is it to have all of those things if your family is a mess? David's first six sons, now the Bible doesn't often list the daughters, but his first six sons were born to six different women. Do you imagine that? And again, we read here about those three, and, and Absalom, eventually the one that killed Amnon, uh, came into the palace, drove David out of the palace. He was the king at the time and took over his throne until Absalom was eventually killed by some of David's soldiers. David's children, unfortunately, were following in his footsteps. They learned their behavior from their parents, from their environment. You know, there are a lot of things that are imparted into our life through our upbringing, some good, some not good. And one of the things that I want to see God do in your life through this series is God deliver you and break break through some of those things. We prayed for that last week, and I got a great testimony from somebody how the Holy Spirit just came over them at the end of the service last week and just broke through some things they'd been carrying for a long time in their life. 
God wants to break through some of these things that have happened because of dysfunction in your life. But unfortunately, we pass our dysfunction down to other people that are a part of our life. And in this case, David's children. Why? Because we read in David's life, he committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba, uh, pretty much had a, a relationship with her that wasn't something that uh, she consented to. She, he had her brought to his house. She became pregnant. And he had her husband killed. And you don't think this affected his children. You don't think they saw this going on in his life. Oftentimes, we get into these things because truth is situational. David could justify things because, after all, he was the king. Sometimes when truth is situational, we get into this entitlement mentality. David thought he was entitled to this woman. He was entitled to being free from uh, these scandals and being blamed for things, so he had her husband killed. He could get away with adultery and murder because he was the king. But the truth is they did not live their lives by absolute moral truth. And his life came caving in around him. I think it's interesting if you take that life of David that got into these things and his kids got into these things and you don't read anywhere in the Bible where he disciplined his kids, where he sat them down and dealt with the rape, dealt with the murder, didn't deal with it, just let it go on, didn't bring the truth into the situation. Contrast that with the life of Joseph. Joseph, who, who was sold into slavery, beaten by his brothers and sold as a slave. Joseph, who was put into prison because he was placed in a situation where Potiphar's wife wanted to have a sexual relationship with him. Joseph, who, who had every reason to give in and not live by absolute moral truth, he let truth be his standard, even in the midst of prison, even in the midst of slavery. David, who was the king, had it much easier, but then lived by truth early on in his life, like Joseph did, who had it very difficult. Sometimes we think truth is situational based on how difficult we have it or how easy we have it. But truth is truth all the time. Amen. You know, we often compare ourselves, and we'll talk more about this in the next uh, sermon coming up, but we compare ourselves to other people in society, and it's a, it's a challenge. You know, uh, our kids come home from school, and they tell us what all the, their friends own, and so we got to buy it for our kids, and they tell us what all their friends are involved in, so we got to get them involved in these things, and it's almost like the kids are raised with a sense of entitlement because their friends are doing these things and having these things. They think they're entitled to having these things and doing these things. And instead of raising our kids according to truth, we raise them according to what other people are doing. And then we can't understand why our kids turn out like their kids. Come on, somebody. you got to look at the path that their kids are headed down and where they're going. We have to raise our kids according to truth. Our kids' exposure to profanity, to seductive and sometimes pornographic images, to immoral behavior, it's all become accepted in today's worldly standards. And so if you want to compete with other families and raise your kids like they're being raised, that's all included in the package because their kids are hearing all kinds of profanity at home all the time. Their kids are allowed to watch just about anything they want to watch on television. Their kids are, are, are exposed to, a lot of kids are home alone all the time, and their parents got a, a full bar there in their house. They don't think their kids are taking advantage of that from time to time. These are the environments that kids are being raised in. And so if you want to compete with and compare yourself to the other families, that's what they're doing. That's not what you want to raise your kids in. That's not the environment that we want to live our life by because comparing leads to compromise. You know, David let his kids do, I think, pretty much whatever they wanted to early on. That was obvious. And again, I said it earlier that sometimes I think we do that because of our upbringing. David, if you remember when Samuel the prophet 
was coming to anoint a king over Israel. He went to Jesse's house, David's dad. And he says, God led me here. One of your sons is going to be the next king. Jesse brought all of his sons out to show them to Samuel, the strongest, the brightest, the most handsome, the most popular. Brought them all out but David. David struggled with being affirmed by his own father, accepted in his own home, popular in his own home. And eventually he got to work in the palace under King Saul. And King Saul got jealous of David, tried to kill him. And so these are the things David struggled with affirmation. He struggled with being rejected, feelings of, of rejections, feelings of, of, of being unloved, unpopular. And so early on in his parenting, what did he, he regress to? I want to be popular with my kids. I want my kids to love me. And they got away with, literally got away with murder. Ever say that about your kids? Oh, these kids are getting away with murder. David's literally did. Because of his parenting approach, it wasn't based in truth. I think back at some of the things that when I was a kid growing up, I remember in the evening sitting and watching television and there were shows that would come out and, and deal with sensitive subject matter or, or use language that was inappropriate in my house. And my dad would say, shut that off, turn that off. 20 years later, those shows were on Nickelodeon. Amen. Why? Because our culture, our society doesn't live by truth. Generations, with it, every generation, truth changes. But according to God, truth doesn't change. It doesn't change. What is right and wrong is right and wrong every time. And so we have to uh, apparent according to what is right and not what is normal. Because what is normal changes all the time. It's normal for people to use profanity all the time now. It's normal for movies to be filled with violence and nudity now. It's normal in today's culture and world for some of that stuff to be shown on television these days. I mean, back in my day when I was being raised, you would never hear the phrase GD on a television program ever. That was completely unacceptable. You can hear it all the time now. What's normal changes. Truth doesn't change. And so we have to make a decision that we want to raise our kids. We want to live our lives as individuals based on what is true, what is absolute, because normal is constantly changing. So David eventually got his act together. And his last son was named Solomon. And Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, the, the, the book of wisdom. And I want to, to read to you from Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 4. He said these words about his father David. He says, my father taught me, take my words to heart, follow my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, develop good judgment. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom for she will protect you. Love her. And you could say wisdom and truth are synonymous. Love her and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her and she will honor you. David, finally his eyes were open and it took him a while. But he got to the point where he turned his life around. And Solomon, number three in your outline, asked for wisdom based on David's parenting. He finally learned some parenting skills. He finally learned that truth is what you want to raise your kids by. He finally got some wisdom, and he told Solomon, wisdom is the greatest thing. I didn't live my life early based on truth, based on wisdom, but I eventually got there. And son, I want you to know, don't, don't make the same mistakes I made. Live your life based on truth. Live your life based on wisdom. After three of his children died, David finally settled down. He finally began to change his ways. And Bathsheba, his final wife, she had five sons with David. And Solomon was the last of these sons. And I want you to notice what Solomon says here. He says, my father taught me. My father taught me. 
My father taught me. And you know, having a father teach his children is something that is so critically important to kids' lives. Fathering is something that is so missing in our world today. And mothers sometimes try to pick up all the slack and carry the load, but there are some things that only a dad can do in a kid's life. And ladies, God bless you if you're a single mom and you're doing it all on your own. But I want to encourage some of you in the church. Again, you might say, Pastor, this is a lesson on children. I don't have any children. Man, every kid in this place needs a father figure in their life. And you can't have enough father figures in your life. Amen. My dad's here this morning. I thank God for 93 years of age. He drives himself to church every Sunday. We've been uh, leading this church for 28 years, and he's been a member of the church ever since, from day one, being the greatest father he can be. And I appreciate that. And he's grown in being a father and being a parent. I got a little emotional this morning. I miss Jerry Foote, man. What a father figure he was to so many people. He used to come and sit in my office every Sunday morning before church. How's it going, Pastor? Sometimes it was like, Jerry, I'm busy. Get out of here. But other times I just needed that calming influence. Somebody that could help me with something I needed done. We need those father figures in our lives today. It doesn't say my mother taught me. My father taught me. Dads, we need to teach our kids teach our kids by our words and our actions. Solomon became the most influential man on the planet because of what David spoke into him. It's never too late to speak into your kids. I mean, I go back and there's things that I wish I would have done better with my kids. There's things that I wish I would have taught them more. Time goes so fast. But I'm still their dad and they're still my kids. And I've got another hopefully 40 years on this earth. And I'm going to keep imparting and teaching into their lives as much as I can. Sometimes they think I'm a nerd and sometimes they think I'm crazy and sometimes they laugh at me. But there's so much I still want to impart into their lives. Speak into your kids. Look what it says in Zephaniah 3, 17. It says, The Lord your God, your Father, is in your midst. The Mighty One will save He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I've talked this morning about how sometimes parents lack affirmation in their life, and so they give their kids freedom, and they they try to uh, base their parenting approach upon making their kids happy because they want to be loved by their kids. Notice what it says that our Father does for us. He affirms us by rejoicing over us with singing. He affirms us by speaking words of love. He quiets us with his love. He rejoices over us. Parents, especially you dads, kids need you to rejoice over them. Not pick apart their flaws and their faults and their screw-ups. I did that. That's one of my regrets with my kids. I was such a, a perfectionist. I'd always point out, you know, they could do nine things right, and I'd I'd focus on the one thing they did wrong. Your kids need your affirmation. They need you to rejoice over what they're doing. Rejoice over them. Because otherwise they'll become that parent that seeks their affirmation from their kids when they should be getting it from their parents. Tell them you're proud of them. Rejoice over all of their accomplishments. We have a lack, a huge lack of affirmation especially in the men in our world these days. The most valuable thing that David gave his son Solomon was the words of truth. It wasn't material things. It wasn't activities. It wasn't freedom. Solomon said it was his wisdom. It was his truth that he spoke into his life. And if we're not careful, our children, number four, will pay for our mistakes. Tamar, Amnon, Absalom, Even the the child that Bathsheba became pregnant with died. They all paid for David's mistakes and the lack of discipline and the lack of absolute moral truth in his life. 
But one thing about David is he allowed his mistakes to give birth to wisdom. Solomon, symbolic of wisdom. We all make mistakes. Don't beat yourself up. Don't wallow in your past and your mistakes. But allow your mistakes to give birth to wisdom. Allow your mistakes to give birth to wisdom. And that's where I believe David finally wrote Psalm 23 that we just got done studying last month. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I need. That's the greatest piece of wisdom you could ever impart into your kid's life. Dad, can I get involved in volleyball? Can I get involved in dance? Can I get involved in swimming? Can I get involved? The Lord is all you need. Can I get an, an iPhone? Can I get the, a, a new car? Can I get this? Can I get that? The Lord is all you need. That's the most important thing you can teach them is to get into the presence of God, to get into the Word of God, to love God with all of their heart. The Lord is all you need. Not the material things, not the popularity, not the involvement. Parenting will do one of two things in your kids' lives. It will impart spiritual blessing or it will impart some type of bondage in their lives. I want to choose blessing, not strongholds, blessing. Finally, I want to leave you with this, and I know we're a little short on time this morning, but this is an important concept. The Bible says, train your children up in the way they should go. And I've taught on this passage many, many times. And I always say the way they should go, not the way they want to go. And I recently began to dig into this in the Hebrew, and it re really means something completely opposite of what I thought it meant, but it still is the same principle. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they won't depart from it. Literally in the Hebrew, it means this, train a child according to their evil intentions or evil inclinations, and they will continually live in those ways throughout the rest of their life. A little bit different slant on that passage, isn't it? But it's the same principle. Let them do whatever they want to do. Train them that happiness comes from things or getting involved or popularity. And when they get older, they'll live their life according to that. But train them in the ways of absolute moral truth. Train them in the ways of the Lord. And when they get older, that will be what will guide and steer their life. Teach them what is true when they are young. And these are the principles that they'll live by the rest of their life. Amen? And that's true for all of us. This isn't just a great teaching for kids. Absolute moral truth should guide all of our lives. David wasn't raised that way. Or he wouldn't have got into issues, and his kids wouldn't have got into issues. But at some point in his life, he began to change. He said those words, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Better is one day in your house than thousands elsewhere. David said those things in his heart. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. David was a man after God's heart, and he finally got there and began to guide his life by truth and passed it down finally to Solomon and hopefully some of his other children as well. Bow your heads with me this morning. Maybe you're here today and you were not raised in an environment where truth was the guide. And although the goal of every parent is to impart, impart spiritual blessing and life into their kids, maybe some things got imparted into you that it becomes strongholds in your life. Maybe there was rejection. Maybe there was hurt. Maybe you didn't have that father figure imparting these things into your life. You know, you can use that as an excuse for the way you're living now. I had a battle in my life that I struggled with my weight most of my life. And I, I used to blame my parents. I got fat when I was four years old. Didn't know any better. But when I became an adult, there was a point in my life where God spoke 
to me very clearly. He said, Terry, you're a grown man. How long are you going to blame your parents for the weight that you're carrying now? And I went on a journey to, to deal with it and lost a lot of weight, still have more to go. Maybe you're here today and, and you've kind of convinced yourself you're entitled to do some of these things because of what you didn't have, the way you were raised, what you lacked in your life. Maybe you're blaming those things as an excuse. But you're all grown up now. You're all grown up. And it's time for you to deal with those things and begin, like David, to live your life by absolute moral truth. Culture will change, society will change, what's normal will change. But I thank my God that he never changes. He's always the same. You can always depend on him. He's a rock of refuge that you can run to. God wants you to break through those things this morning, those strongholds in your life. Father, I pray that if there's anybody that's being spoken to by the Holy Spirit right now, anybody that's struggling in these areas, anybody that's been raised in a dysfunctional environment and can't figure out why they're living in that now, Father, I pray that you would break that cycle today, that it would end with them, that they would open their eyes to the truth, to the truth, and receive you as their Lord, their Savior, their guide, their truth today, Lord, and begin to allow you to be what steers and guides their life. Hallelujah just taking some time this morning because I feel God is, is touching hearts right now and I don't want to be in a hurry. But just open your heart today. Just, just pray this with me. Say, God, I need you. I open my heart and I invite you to guide and steer my life with your truth. I confess that I have not lived the way that I should. And I take responsibility today for my life. And I confess my sin. And I ask you to forgive me. And from this day forward, I make a commitment to live by your truth, to make you the Lord of my life. I ask for your mercy and your grace to help me do that. Help me be a light and an example to the next generation so that we can change what's normal back to what's true. Use me, God, I pray, to be a, a, a positive role model in the lives of everyone around me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, hallelujah. I hope you enjoyed this this morning. Uh, we do have, like I said, a special fellowship at the Cider Mill in uh, Armada today. I hope you can come and join us. Uh, we're sending people ahead to purchase some cider and donuts so they'll be ready when you get there. So that'll be the first thing we want to do is eat. And then there's all kinds of different activities that you're welcome to take advantage of on your own, at your own expense. But uh, come and hang out with us today. It's a sunny day. I know it's not hot, but it's not cold. It's a good fall day today. These are designed to get to know people better. We want to get to know you a little bit better, so hopefully you come and be with us. Uh, if you can't join us, we do have some refreshments in the lobby as well. Stick around. Make sure if you're new that you visit our connection counter. Uh, we'd like to connect with you and, and put some uh, information in your hands and get some information from you as well. God bless you. We love you. Have a great day.